Oh my gosh. My toe toes are on fire, honey. <laughs> hey, Carl. Hey, Kenny. Hey, Tom. <laughs> Nathan, everybody, TLC <laughs> Army in the house. Hey, 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 hey. Christy. <laughs> hey. A lot of familiar faces there, right? Absolutely. They're really supportive of yeah. TLC. And moi. And you. Oh, wow. Yes. It's whole, and, like a whole shebang bang. Yes. Okay. This is the, the, uh, the cover of your new book, Out This Week, yes. called The Sick Life. Uh, congratulations. Thank this, you. This is an uh, you know, intense book. You talk a lot about everything from relationships to mm -hmm. Your illness, you know, mm -hmm. su suffering from um, sickle cell. Uh, yeah, and and then you also talk a lot about TLC. So, mm -hmm. what was it like, kind of going, looking back at your life, and just putting it all down on paper? It makes you think about yourself. <laughs> it didn't sound like me or my story. I'm like, wow, this is kind of interesting. Like, mm -hmm. you don't really realize how much you've really gone through until you start, you know writing a book because you really get into some of your innermost dark secrets. And I had to do that in order to tell these stories. So it was different because I'm not really an open person like that with people I don't know. So it was real, 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 real unique, eh, for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was. Yeah, I mean, did you find it cathartic in some ways? It was very therapeutic. Um, but I really faced my fear and got over telling about myself because I felt like God spared my life and I have a testimony to share and it's more of a triumph story because you know usually you hear about people and they're dead and gone but I'm still here to live and tell my experiences so I was like why not because like you said anybody from any age or walk of life can get something whether it's being teased in school mm -hmm. um being sick no matter what you're sick from something foreign in your body we all can relate and then, you know, being a divorced woman or a single mother, like, so there's different things you can get from my book. Absolutely. You were diagnosed at what age with sickle cell disease? Well, they knew I had some type of mm -hmm. sickle cell at birth, mm -hmm. but I was misdiagnosed at seven years old, so I didn't get diagnosed properly until I was 28. And at what point did they say, you might not live till to see 30? When I was seven. Yeah. But usually the doctor pulls the parent aside. I was like, what the hell? Like, <laughs> if I could, I mean, I ain't cuss, but that's what I was thinking. <laughs> you know, like I looked at my mama like, what the hell? You know, yeah. most doctors don't tell a seven-year-old, you can die by the time you're 30. You'll never have kids and you'll be disabled your whole life. And I looked at my mom immediately and she said, we'll talk in the car. God has the last say so in your life. So I was like, Yeah. That's right, yeah. you know. Yeah. So I believe my mom over the doctor because she was like, they practice medicine and that doesn't have to be so. You could do anything. You put your mind to Tian, and she never treated me like I was sickly. So that's what I did. Yeah. And what did you? Um, what do you still do today? That um, with with the illness, with the disease, that you have to you know keep on monitoring, et cetera. I work on it every day. It's an everyday thing, um, and I do way more than the average artist just to stay healthy but um i started being my own advocate and learning about my body because what works for one sickler doesn't always work for the next and uh i take a lot of holistic you know medicines mm -hmm. and supplements that are derived from plants and from the earth and that really has helped me this is the second tour i've ever out of my whole career made it through without getting sick wow it's crazy. give it up like, I was, <laughs> I ruined every tour before that, like, Tian's sick again. Yeah. Like, I was like, okay. Yeah. But, um, yeah, so I'm really happy about that. But I do oxygen before and after the show. Mm -hmm. I take a lot of drops that I put in drinks, and I have, I get acupuncture, massages. Like, I do a lot. Yeah, yeah. Well, we're so glad to hear you're doing well. Thank and you. uh And the tour, you've been doing the I Love 90s tours. You, uh, how's that been going so far? Yeah, we're, um, so it's two versions. It's I Love the 90s, and then we're on the I Love the 90s, the Party Continues tour. Of course, because it so should long. always continue. Right. <laughs> and we're headlining. It's really been fun. And I've seen people, you know. <laughs> I've seen y'all, like, a lot, right? <laughs> But that's awesome because this is your, what, fifth show? Fifth time seeing me? Yeah. Christy? Yeah. Yeah, y'all. <laughs> Olivia? So um, it's been awesome. I mean, that's where I belong. It's like yeah. my second home. Like, I belong on the stage. Like, that's what I always wanted. That's what I love to do. 
Like, so I'm sad that there's only two shows left and we're about to wrap it up. Yeah, yeah. But it coincides lo- amazingly with the first album you guys have released in like some 15 years. Which That's is, crazy. It's insane. Um, why 15 did, years. 15 years. What mm-hmm. was it like getting back into the studio and also, um, you know, did, was it emotional? Was it exciting? I stay nervous, like, huh? because that's a lot of pressure. Oh, y'all had Unpretty Scrubs, Waterfalls. I mean, what you going to sound like now? What you doing? Mm, I don't know, because, you know, her brother's producing. Is it just because it's her brother? Like, it's all them comments. I was like, <laughs> dang, y'all. And I don't know. Like, they were, I'm a fan, but, you know, I'm scared. I was like, y'all, dang. <laughs> like, lighten up on a sister, you know? <laughs> Like, I still know what I'm doing, I think. Like, I was second-guessing myself, like, I think I like this song. <laughs> like, <laughs> Jesus, so y'all do to me. But um, once you get on a roll, uh-huh. it's comfortable. Because I write for other people, and I write all the time. Me and my brother, K.O., and he produced a lot on the album, too, and introduced us to a lot of writers who did songs like Perfect Girls, American Gold, and, you know... Um, he even introduced me to the guy who did way back. You know, with, yeah. I wrote that with my friend. So uh, it, it's trying. But once you get on the roll and you figure out who you want to be this time and how you want to sound, and I always got something to say. My big mouth is always talking about something, <laughs> you know, and I people watch and I got stuff to talk about. Yeah. So um, it felt good. I felt like I was home again. I was like, yes. So... I kind of like woo side and calmed down, got the album down. Then I got nervous again, and so did Chili. So I was like, oh, now we got to see if they like it. Because they was hard on us. I don't like the album title. I don't like the cover. I was like, uh, <laughs> yeah, you know. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, well, damn. You know, like, okay, hopefully they like the music. So it was like, whew. Do you guys when... like the music? Yeah. yeah. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Because I was like, oh, my God. Like, I'm going to go hide under a rock. Like, yeah, but they liked it, and the, the response was good. All right. Well, okay. Well, I, I, I've seen it. I've heard it. It's, it's yeah. awesome. So is it really your last album as TLC? Yes. Yes. Oh, man. You're breaking our hearts. No, but it doesn't mean it's the last of TLC. Okay. All right. Because All right. this is the thing. Y'all, we've been here 25 years, and we have a body of music, which, you know, that's a blessing. A lot of people can't say that. And we have some timeless songs. So why not do something like a residency, which is easier, right? Yes. Going to Vegas, is. right? It's easier, yeah. like, on me, especially with Sickle Cell. I'll be mm-hmm. in one climate, one place, not on a bus, bumping all around <laughs> to the next place. Like, that's not an easy life. Like, it's, it's like... <laughs> Half the time I did tea bars, I mean tea time with tea bars, y'all just had woke up. What you talking about? That was, that's why everybody was like, why is she wearing shades in the picture? Because I had bags. That's why. Like, I was tired. I just woke up. Sure. Like, so, yeah, I think it would be fun, but it's not the last of TLC. Okay. Like, I want to do movies. There's so much other stuff I want to do. But it's, as far as a studio album, at this time, no, this is the last one. So yeah. y'all go get it because if you don't have it, I mean, it is the last. Oh, huh. You're missing out. Yeah. It's incredible that TLC is still one of the, if not, it is the best-selling all-girl group of all time, right? Seriously. Yeah, yeah. It's Thank you. incredible. How, what, do you, what do you feel when you hear that and when someone says that to you? It's surreal. It sounds crazy. Like, I'm like, what? <laughs> But probably if somebody challenges me, I'd be like, you know, we are. No, but um, no, I, I mean, it's an honor. You know, I'm blessed. You know, as a child, my mom always, like I said, said I could do whatever I put my mind to. And she said, as long as I kept my morals, my integrity and character intact, she would always support me. And she was like, but always be the best at whatever you choose to do, whatever that is. And I'm like, mom, now I can say I did my best, you know, so I'm proud of that, you know. I know you talk a lot about that in the book and your mm-hmm. mom's influence and everything. Why do you think there's been no other group able to top you, TLC, since then? Well, <laughs> I think that our lyrical content, I think it's more than just music with us. I mean, of course, we had a look like I was known for sideburns and, you know, Chili got her baby hair and Lisa's <laughs> spunky attitude and her rap style, her crazy hairstyles. Like, our image was as big as we were as well. You know, we were known for trend setting with clothes and stuff, but I think our music has touched people in a different way. And I get this from them. Mm-hmm. This isn't me because I didn't know at first either. But if it saved your life or it really changed your life in some kind of way, I think people really grasp 
that mm-hmm. and hold on to that because you can remember certain songs how you felt but if this song really spoke to you in a way where it changed your life or made you feel better as a person that means a lot and a lot of people like when I met Lady Gaga and I took my daughter to meet her and she started crying and said I was an outcast and unpretty made me feel like I fit in that means a lot that means we're doing our job and the lyrics I wrote I felt like that was personal and what I was going through but I didn't know so many people felt the way I felt and I was like, oh, so we're in this together, you know? So I think that's what our music does. It's like one big family, and we're in this together type yeah. thing, music. <laughs> it's relatable, right? Mm-hmm, it absolutely. absolutely is. It's organic, too, and I think you can feel that. It's real. Everything we talk about, you can relate to at some point in time in your life. A lot in the book, you talk a lot about, of course, the great times, but there's also, like, some challenges, of course, losing Lisa. Oh, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that and what it was like to kind of recount losing Lisa in in the book and, and, you know, how you feel today when you think about her. This is my thing. Um, Me and Lisa was really close, so no one teaches you how to grieve, but I don't feel like I ever got to grieve properly because I've lost loved ones. Like, my aunt passed while I was writing this book. Mm -hmm. My grandma passed. You know, um, my cousin passed. So, but with Lisa, I had to live it out with the world which I wasn't ready for. Everywhere I went, I seen birth and death numbers. And then I didn't know how to take people smiling at me the next day. I can rap. Like, well, huh? What do you mean? You know, if you're looking for somebody like she just passed away yesterday right. and then smiling at me and going, can I take a picture? Sorry for your loss. And I was like, I, I don't feel right about this because you're smiling and I'm, I'm unhappy. I'm sad. I'm broken. So I was depressed probably about two years. We were, that was my creative partner. Mm-hmm. And she was family. She really became my cousin too because my uncle's married to her mom to this day. But I just couldn't deal mm-hmm. And then the questions that I would get were harsh, like I wasn't human. One interview we did, the lady said to me, well, do you feel if you wasn't sick and hadn't gotten sick, that is your fault she died because if you hadn't gotten sick, she wouldn't have went to Honduras? And I paused like I wanted to punch her out the chair. Yeah. (laughs) And I was known for hitting people too, so... (laughs) Everybody, like, got quiet. Yeah. They was, like, all junk. But I thought about it, and I was, like, I envisioned her falling out the window, everything, real quick. But I was, like, I said, no. She, You know, I did the right thing. I was, like, no, she went to Honduras anyway. That was her peaceful place, and she was doing what she always does. But, you know, when the, some people ask me insensitive questions, I was, like, well, how do you feel when you lost your mom? Right. Like, that's just dumb. And so today... Like, she passed away before my birthday, the day before my birthday, but it came out in the press on my birthday, so people get it confused. Yeah. Then I always get texts. It's 15 years later, and people's like, I'm sorry, Teal, you know, happy birthday, but don't do that to me. Just say happy birthday, because I'm in a place now. Don't take me to what was me and feeling bad. I want to celebrate her life. I want to feel good about what we did together. I don't want to be, like, in a dark place anymore, because I want to remember that we built something great together and and keep that going for her, because that was my promise to her, and that's what we started together, even before I met Chili. So... Like, don't, don't do that. Just let's, let's be in a happy place and a good place and think about the good things that she brought to the table in this group. And it's always going to be TLC forever. Like, yes. you know? Yes. I love that. Because people say OTC, the L. No, don't do that. No, no way. It's like, TLC. I be wanting to come through the computer like, what you talking about? <laughs> like, you know, like, geez, like, don't do that. Yeah. You, you have, I mean, it just sounds like you have a real connection with your fans, though. You're really in tune. Mm-hmm. Like, you, you know. You know these people out here. You know these fans that have been with you through it all. What do you hope that um, TLC's legacy is? I just want to be remembered for what we really did. Not the bull crap, not the lies, but mm-hmm. changing lives. Strong lyrical content. Um, the awesome clothes, the fun, the hairstyles, the laughs. The, you know, just everything. Yeah, we do yeah. together. Chase has a video of Carl. And he's going like this because he knows all the routines. And her and her friends crack up. That's her favorite video. Chase loves it. Yeah, my daughter even knows the TLC Army. She'd be like, Mommy, Carl is so funny. (laughs) You know? She'd be like, hey! She does his dance at home. And she'll be, like, showing everybody, Grandma, look at Carl. Uh, So, Carl, you're a hit in our house, honey. (laughs) (laughs) I love that. I love that. There were times, though, that you write about in the book where... 
you know, you were shooting a video and there was so much, so much intern, you know, internal drama that things might not have been done. Like you almost felt like we might not get this video shot. Like what was some of the most challenging times <laughs> that you had with the band? She's laughing. but Because it's funny now because yeah. I was 38 hot boy back then. Um, this, well, yeah, we never broke up, but there was a couple of times where I questioned it, you mm. know, like, uh, because I understood what Lisa wanted and I understood you know, when you're creative and you want something and sometimes creative people have to get it out. They have to do it. But I never had a problem with her going solo. Mm -hmm. It was when she decided to and how she went about it. So when she wanted to go solo, we were already in a contractual obligation and we had to turn the album in. Mm -hmm. And she wanted to just leave and go record with Suge and become Nina. And I'm like, we could, hello, you know. So we fell out about it, but the thing about sisters and family, you argue and you make back up. You can respectfully agree to disagree, and there's no love lost just because we don't see eye to eye. Mm -hmm. you know. So I think some people looked at it like, uh-oh, they're about to this and that. No, nah, we're just going through what family's doing. We'll bring it all back together you know, when everybody gets some sense again, and that's what happened. Yeah, and so much great music came came out of that. It's, <laughs> Thank you. it's really amazing. You have a lot on your plate. I know that mm -hmm. you want to get behind the scenes a little bit, right? Absolutely. Yeah, so yeah. what are your own aspirations? Well, ATL was the first movie that I executive produced, and it was about my life growing up in the hood and jelly beans in Atlanta. So I don't know if y'all saw the movie, but Lauren London played me. T.I. played Dallas. The only part that wasn't true, me and Dallas did not kiss, and we did not go together. Okay, that is Chili Baby Daddy. So that part was just the movie. Got it. And then um, Crazy Sexy Cool, the TLC story, was the second one I EP'd. So now, when I had the brain tumor and I had three and a half years to do physical therapy and heal, I was going crazy. So my mom said, you have an idle mind. You need to do something with it because this is not working. You're driving us crazy, too. <laughs> so I taught myself how to write movie scripts. And <laughs> now that's coming in handy now because I live in L.A. And now I'm about to start working on movies and TV things that I've written. So, um, yeah, I told you I ain't going nowhere just because it's the last studio album. I'm just saying. <laughs> I got stuff to do. You got stuff to do. What else do you have to do? Fashion? Anything with that? Oh, absolutely. I had Chase's Closet. I closed it and it was it was like the best store in Texas four years running that we were open. And I had a private label, and I plan to do more children's clothes. I'm calling this one Baby Bouge oh, nice. because kids are little protégés of us. And um, also with this book, I have an audio CD, and I have a song entitled Dreams. My brother produced it. Um, I wrote it with a couple of people who wrote on the TLC album. Mm -hmm. um, well, no, one girl is Debbie. Mm -hmm. Candace wrote on TLC, but... Debbie, she's from London. She wrote that with me. But it's about my mom or anybody who's lost a mother or someone who was in your corner who always supported your dreams. And it basically talks about I can hear your voice even if you're not physically here, but I can hear everything you say to me to help me not get in trouble or help me believe in myself. And it makes me feel so safe. And it's on iTunes, but it's a very sentimental song to me um, because my mom, for me, was that person. Mm -hmm. And... Um, you know, I just hope people like that one, too. <laughs> that's awesome. So that's a little bit of your solo career, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I've done kind of solo, solo stuff. Yeah, a little bit of your solo career. Mm -hmm. You're a mom now, too. Um, yeah. So what kind of um, things do you want to impart on your children? Oh, to fight for everything you believe in and be yourself and um, be true to yourself. Respect yourself. That's real important. Yeah. Because if you don't respect yourself, why should anybody else? So especially in a world that we live in today where hoism is the hot thing to be and do. I want no hoes in my house. Yeah. Hello. Yeah, right. No. I don't let social media raise my child. Yeah. That's the thing. You have to be a parent. Because she's going to see it all. Mm -hmm. But I'm just, I keep a G with my daughter. I'll be like, you know she ain't have to hoe like that, right? <laughs> You know, <laughs> so. well, well, songs like No Scrubs, I mean, came out so many years ago, but they're still the, the sentiment still resonates today. Do you think even more so? Oh, with Scrubs? Yeah. Like with all of your music. Um, I just think you things come back around. You have to yeah. reiterate your, you know, everything to everybody like just this generation, the next generation. You can't tell people like 
Unpretty at the time was telling you to, you know, um, you're beautiful the way you are, mm-hmm. blah, blah, blah. And, you know, society has a way of making us feel like we're not good enough to fit in. I wrote Perfect Girls about, because they're social media and little girls are looking at other Instagram models wishing to be perfect. Mm-hmm. No one's perfect. We all have flaws. We all have insecurities. You're lying if you say you don't. And the reason those girls alter their bodies is because they were insecure about something. That's why they enhanced it or fixed it. Let's keep it real. So what I'm saying is you're, you're striving for something that doesn't exist. You know? So they have filters and apps that make booby cakes big and your butt protrude out. I'm like, God, I didn't know that, girl. I was about to be over there like, mm, mm, mm. Nah, but <laughs> I, didn't, I never knew that, you know? And um, I just want little girls to know it's okay to be yourself and love yourself because you're special and you're away. And it's okay if people want to have plastic surgery, but just keep it real. You didn't like your titties, so you got some big ones. <laughs> just tell it like it Just is. don't lie about yeah. it. Like, yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah. We could keep you up here all day, but we have some <laughs> questions from your fans okay. out here. So I'd love to get that rolling. Who's first? Oh, right okay. here. Hello. Hi. Um, so I'm Sydney. I'm a nurse. I work in blood cancers and blood disorders. Mm-hmm. So I'm aware of sickle cell. And I feel like there's not that many like crazy advances in the treatment and the medications for it, whether that be because of disparities in the medicine or mm-hmm. because most people that have it are people of color. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm wondering, like, are there any ways to bring awareness to it? Um, are there any foundations that, you know, my patients, a lot of times I feel like they're down and, you know, however they're feeling about it, what can I tell them or what kind of like things can they do or we all can do to bring awareness to it? And see, this is one of the things that bothers me as well is because I feel like there's not enough knowledge about it. There's not enough awareness and there's not a- enough people doing things to make a difference. And so that's why I started T-Boz Unplugged, which I'm having another one September 27th, where, thank you, where, because I wasn't even getting help. I'm, I'm the national spokesperson, and I sold over 85 million albums, and they will not utilize me. You say you want to, but, and then when I go and break my butt to get on Dr. Oz and the doctors and, you know, um, um, Celebrity Apprentice to raise awareness, and I go and do a charity event, then they try to take the money from the people I gave it to. What? So I will not work with the SCDAA no more until they change presidents or figure something out because it's not a territory. Whatever territory I stand on is my territory and I can give to whoever I want. I've raised like a quarter million dollars and the kids told me they never got the toys. That broke my heart. So now the people I work for, they they do holistic medicines and they have support groups which I can give you information on so people who think they're the only ones that's dealing with this because even though our loved ones see us hurt they don't always understand because you're not going through it they'll be like oh you're taking too much medicine or are you sure this is that or that but you don't get it you know what I'm saying I get it because I really go through it and if you have another person like when me and my cousin would talk, we understood because it was something that we shared. And another thing is you have to be your own advocate because you're the only person who can convey what's going on with you to the doctor. You know what I'm saying? And the thing is, is we can all read the book on sickle cell. You know, how you play that game when everybody sits in a circle and you whisper something. It always comes back different. Right. Same thing with sickle cell. We can all read the book. That don't mean you really get it. And you know how somebody will say, oh, because what works for one may not work for the next. You know how you'll say, oh, you know, weed is good. Eat wheat. Then you come back 10 years later, weed is bad. That's because somebody had an experience. So things change. Doctors practice medicine. Things evolve, you know, and they find out things. So it changes. So um, with my um, charity event that I give, we stream it, and the, the money from the streams go to help put on the event and to go to the kids, 100% of the proceeds go to the kids. So Snoop Dogg, Naughty by Nature, The Brat, SWV, Faith Evans, Eric Bellinger, and Raphael Sadiq have all helped me give concerts, and I'm having another one. So I can't say what everybody should do, but I'm trying my best because I want to live too, and they don't have a cure for people. It stops at 40. They don't even think about trying to save us because they feel like we're so used and bruised up and just... Like, but I have a two-year-old. 
I want to be here. He needs me. My daughter needs me. I want to raise my kids. I want to live too. So what about us? You know, you can't just research a certain group. What about all of us? And the only person I know, and I'm almost done. I know this is long. The only person I know that was healed happened to have leukemia. So when I went to Congress to keep the bill going for bone marrow transplants, and people don't know I get that deep into this, like I went to Congress, okay? And I fought to keep the bill going. She just happened to be healed from sickle cell because she had leukemia, and cancer is always talked about. AIDS is always talked about. You never hear about sickle cell. So I'm questioning why that is too. When it predominantly affects us, I get more other nationalities to help me than my own people. So I'm stuck where you are. And I'm not saying this, I'm saying this because I'm in this fight. And I want to know why my people won't help either. So only thing I can tell you is to, like I have avenues like this, but this is a blessing where they let me use my platform to speak on things like this. That's the only thing I can do. I can write a book like this and I can talk about things and I'm just doing all I can in any way that I can. And, and that's what I think everybody else should do. Speak up. Don't be quiet. Well, thank you. Give, give her. Mm. We're so glad you're speaking up. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. Good question. Next. Hi, How are you? Hi. Um, I wanted to speak from a, the perspective of a mom because I have mm -hmm. a five-year-old son and my question is, Twofold. He's in and out of the hospital 39 times to about 45 times a year. And so I wanted to ask you, how did you gain strength in your worst crisis to give to your mom? And what strength did your mom gain when you were in your worst crisis to give to you? Because as a mother, watching my son every time he's in crisis and I can't help him, it breaks my heart watching him in pain. You know... I can't imagine, because now that I'm a mom, I, you know, it, like my, my son can have a little toothache in it, and I'm like, oh, you know? So something so severe like that, I cannot imagine what my mom thought or how she was so strong to deal with that. It had to be God or something. And I don't push my beliefs on nobody. I just tell you, I know there's been miracles in my life. And doctors even came out and said, I don't know why she's still here. So I believe in God and I pray, you know? And the best thing for you is to always be there. You know, you can't ever show them. You know, when you cry or if you're upset, you know, they always tell you walk out the room. You got to always remain strong. And I commend you for that because it's hard to watch your child sick like that. And I know. And I just, my mom was a God-fearing woman and she had a lot of faith and belief, you know. And she always sat by my side. The best medication was me waking up and her just being there. My dad was never in the hospital with me. Like when I was an adult and I had a brain tumor surgery, he finally was there. But as a child, my mom was my everything. So you just being there with him, you have no idea how much that means. And just console him and make him feel better and be understanding. Even things that you may not understand if time goes on. Do your research. Listen to other people's experiences. And you have to watch his body. Like I have this book and I write in it. Because the worst thing with us is we have such a high tolerance for pain, we don't really realize how sick we are. And you'll notice that when he gets older. And I had to start paying attention to my body because when I lost my spleen, I still did my radio show. I did my block. I was like, yeah, it hurts when I breathe, but oh well. I should have been in the hospital. I could have died. I ended up in ICU the next day. Who knew I was that sick? So there's holistic things that you can also putting your son's drink is just like a couple of drops and he can drink it and you can take it with whatever medicine the doctor gives because it's all natural and I'll tell you about it before I leave I'll write them down and you can just try it but what it does is the medications they give us in the hospital keep us in a weakened state and when your weak sickle cell attacks that whatever trauma your body's having these vitamins help you not stay weak it helps you get strong and it gets the toxins out of your body so doing a steam shower for him after he's out of the hospital get all those metals out get that medicine out of him because that medicine is going to keep him in a weakened state and then it takes three to six months to get the holistic stuff so just start and see if it starts making a difference and if it does you'll see him get stronger and it'll end up being so when he does have a crisis it's not as bad or as long and he won't get as sick as often and I'm saying this from experience that's what happened to me because I was sick that much and now I'm not like that so it really made a difference and how you think makes a difference too. mind over matter I have a chapter that says that 
When you think sick, you'll be sick. My cousin thought sick. He died exactly at the age the doctor said. Me, I didn't. And I think that's the way I, I was thinking, you know? So speak the things you want and, 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 and teach him to say, because words are powerful. I want to be better. I want to heal. I want to get out the hospital. What do you want to do when you get out? You know what I mean? That kind of thing works. But just you being a good mom is more support than you can ever realize. Like, so good job. Great advice. Another question. Who's next? Right here. Oh, Hi. Um, I just wanted to first say thank you. Uh, you and TLC have inspired me so much. I'm thank only you. 19, but y'all wow. are like my biggest inspiration to wanting to pursue a career as a performer. But um, I just wanted to ask your advice, um, especially going into this career field with contracts and people pushing what they want your image to be, how y'all were able to like do what y'all wanted and like advice you have for going into this type of industry. Well, sometimes staying true to yourself, you may miss out on opportunities. There's a lot of opportunities that pass me by, but you have to be willing to let some things go if you don't want to change because this person wants you to be that way. I lost a lot of money and a lot of deals because I refused, but it only takes one to say yeah. It only takes one to believe in you. And that's a choice and decision you have to make, but this industry is so hard and so different. Like, you got to get in where you fit in in any way possible. Like, but now they have outlets like social media, you know, going to the studio, you know, producers have so many relationships with artists. Like, you have to try each avenue. It's almost like a hustle. Now, hustle whichever way you can because things are different. And don't give your music to people because they will steal it. Always play it for them and take it back with you because <laughs> even the big people steal. Trust me. Oh, man. Well, thank you so much for sharing your story with us oh, today. And it's all in this book and more. It's called mm -hmm. A Sick Life. Give it up one more time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.